Hey everybody, and welcome to my first vi uh, video of two on this, the Minolta Maxim 7000. The Minolta Maxim 7000 is an interchangeable lens, multi-mode SLR. The Minolta Maxim 7000 was called the Maxim in the United States. In Japan, it was called the Alpha 7000. Some, some, in some markets, it was called just the Minolta 7000, and then in other markets, like the like Europe, it was called the Dynax 7000. So the Minolta Maxim 7000 is an interchangeable lens SLR, meaning that the lens on the front of it can be removed and others can be put on for different effects. It has a center-weighted averaging meter that is focused and center-weighted around the camera's single autofocus point has shutter speed, which range on the slow end from 30 seconds up to 1 2,000th on the fast end. That is an incredible range, as well as bulb. Through the viewfinder, you would see, uh, with a normal lens, an eight, a 50 millimeter lens, you would see uh, an 85x magnification. What that means is that the image you see through the viewfinder is 85% of the size that would be on the film and it has 94% frame coverage. What that means is that when you're looking through the viewfinder, let's say that what you're seeing here is through the viewfinder, you would lose about 3% on each side and then 3% on the top and bottom uh, on average. That's typically what that means. With this camera, you probably lose a little bit more on the bottom than on the top because there's a data display down here that uh, comes up into the viewfinder a little bit further, but that, that part's just a guess. At any rate, you see 94% of what's going to be on the film through the viewfinder, meaning you have a little bit of framing and cropping ability on the final prints. This has a standard single point autofocus uh, focusing screen in it, which is interchangeable, and when we look through the camera's viewfinder in the second video, I'll show you what that looks like and the flash on this camera sinks at 1 1 25th of a second, which is a pretty decent speed. The target market for the Minolta 7000 was the high-end user or as a backup body for professional photographers. It has uh, a, few, a few quirks that will not make it perfect for everyone. You cannot do a double exposure on this camera, for instance but it was the first camera that used an onboard computer to control the lenses and the accessories such as the flash. That was a pretty huge step forward that Minolta made with this camera. The lenses for this camera also had onboard computer chips that communicated with the camera and allowed the camera to optimize the functionality of the lens, especially when used in program mode. So even though this is a high-end camera, it was a camera that could perform extremely well for entry-level users, although I won't lie, there's a lot of buttons on this camera. It's a pretty daunting interface, even for an advanced user. The Minolta 7000 was built by Konica Minolta in Japan starting in 1985 and it was discontinued in all probability in 1988 though I couldn't find a firm date for its discontinuing. It was preceded by, by nothing. This was the first Maxim camera that rep and re represented an entirely new engineering. It was followed concurrent with the Maxims 5000 and 9000 and followed by the Maxim 7000i which built upon the 7000 framework and streamlined it significantly in terms of the interface. I will tell you though, even though the 7000i followed this camera and is theoretically a better camera, I really happen to like the 7000 more. So if you have your Minolta 7000, let's take a look at the interface elements. In this video we're going to look at the, the camera's interface elements and then in the second video We'll go through all of them, and it will be a lot of detail, but at the end of the second video, you should be able to use this camera with no doubts whatsoever that you can take a great photo with it. So starting technically on the sides, here are the camera strap lugs, and this is what you would attach your camera strap to. 
we have the exposure plus minus right here. This is your exposure compensation button and it allows you to intentionally over or underexpose images. The ISO button right here is the red one and it allows you to change your ISO or select DX code for automatic ISO reading. Here's the mode button and this allows you to switch between program, aperture priority, shutter priority, or full manual camera modes. We'll show you how to do that when we look at the LCD screen in the second video and I'll talk about what each of the modes are and what they do and how they affect your photography. And the drive mode button, this allows you to change drive from single frame to continuous. Here's the camera's hot shoe and great thing about this camera compared to the 7000i and one thing I don't like about the 7000i that followed it is this has a normal hot shoe. This has the nonsensical proprietary hot shoe that allows you to only use Minolta and Sony flashes on it. This allows you to use actual normal flashes, which is pretty fantastic. It's the only maximum I've ever come across, and I have four of them sitting on my couch right now that I'm doing videos for tonight in rapid succession. This is the only one of them that has a normal hot shoe. Here's the LCD screen. Along the top, it tells you what modes you're using. This will tell you your aperture, uh, I'm sorry, your shutter speed on the top and your aperture on the bottom. Film says how many frames you have, you, you've used, zero, I have no film loaded in it right now. S is for single, uh, single shot, single, single frame means you just push the button. Oh, come on, I just put you in manual focus. There we go. Single frame means you just push the button and it takes a picture, whereas in drive, and continuous drive. It takes multiple pictures and just keeps going. A little bit noisy. And ST is self timer and it counts down. On the top you can see the the countdown that it's doing, which is pretty darn cool. Here we have the uh, let's see flash hot shoe LCD data panel main switch. This is the main switch lock on and beep. Beep turns on a speaker, uh, which is a great way to let everyone know you're taking photos of them. On turns on the camera so that it'll work and lock. It's not an off button. This camera has no off button. So as long as you have a battery in it, it's going to drain the battery. You can see even in lock mode, it, it has the LCD displaying information. So if you want to have it turned off and not drain the battery, you have to remove the battery, which is a bit of a downside. P is your program reset button and that allows you to uh, hit this to reset your programming and we'll look at that more in the second video. These are your shutter speed keys right here and this in shutter priority mode allows you to adjust your shutter speed. This is your shutter release so this is the button that you push to act actuate the shutter. So here we are on the front of the camera so let's take a look at what we've got here. Here is the self timer light so you might have been able to see it up above that this was blinking when the self timer was counting down. This is the lens mount. It is a uh, the, the Minolta now Sony A mount. Uh, right here is the autofocus drive coupling pin and you can see when I switched autofocus up that, that snapped into place and when I put it back to manual focus it retracts into the body. Here along the top of the lens mount we have the electrical contacts and you can see on the lens there are electrical contacts right there and those communicate with the camera body through those pins. This red dot is your lens mount indicator. Right here, this is the lens lock pin that is retracting into the body when I push that, that button. And that keeps the lens in place so that it doesn't fall off the bayonet when you mount it. This button right here is the lens lock release, so this is the button you would push to unmount your lenses. This button right here on the side beneath the lens lock release is your autofocus manual focus selector switch. These buttons right here are your aperture keys. So when you're in full manual or aperture priority mode, these allow you to adjust your aperture. This is the remote release cover and port. The cover is the piece that I just pulled off of it. And this is the port where your remote control connects. And on the very side here, this is the film back open button and switch. On the other side, we have the battery chamber. And we'll talk a little bit later about different batteries, but there are different battery covers for this camera that allow it to take different batteries. But this will just screws in and unscrews. And this is the one that takes the pretty fantastic um, super battery, basically. 
here on the camera's bottom we have the serial number as well as the country of manufacture. Then we have the tripod bushing and the uh, the battery uh, the control grip contact. So there's a uh, not not a power grip because this has a built-in motor, but there's a uh, an additional control grip that will contact uh, that will communicate with the camera through this. I don't have one of those. I don't know exactly what it does, but it's one of uh, one of the features and items that in this camera support system. On the camera's back, here we have the film type window. So when you load your film, you can read the type of film that's in there and also know that something is inside of it. Here's the viewfinder. And looking at the viewfinder, you can see that it has some accessory grooves that you could put different accessories on. One of the most useful additional accessories being the shade that would block out any light when you're taking uh, long exposures. Here we have the film rewind release switch and you push this button down and then slide it over to rewind the film and auto exposure lock. This is your AE lock. Going inside the camera, here we have the film cassette chamber. This is where the film will be loaded when you load your film and we'll see that in the second video. This is a cassette spring that helps to keep it properly aligned so that the film unloads correctly. These are DX code readers that allow the camera to know what type of film is loaded. These contacts along the bottom would be for a data back, which I don't have, but would allow the uh, camera to use the data back to put information onto the negative about time and date of, uh, that, it was, that the image was photographed. Uh, these silver rails here and these six silver dots are the film guide rails. And what the dots do is they keep the film from moving up and down so that it advances smoothly. And then the silver rails help keep the film flat on plane as it progresses across the camera's back so that uh, the image is focused properly on the film. There's the, the shutter. This is the part that would open and close when you take a picture. Here are the, this is the film, uh, film tension sprocket. And what this does is keep, this rotates uh, in the direction of the film film's movement when the film is advanced so that it is taken up uh, evenly and smoothly by the film advance or film take up spool rather. This orange dot is the film leader index and when we load the film we'll see that you load the leader, you pull the leader out to here, not any shorter or further for it to properly advance the film when it automatically loads itself. On Here we are on the camera's back and this is a film guide roller. That is, the film is being taken up by the uh, take-up spool, helps it to advance properly and keep tension on it right here so that it, the film advance sprocket stays through the register holes on the film and can provide the proper amount of tension. Here's the film pressure plate that works in conjunction with the film reel, uh, film guide rails to keep the film flat and uh, behind the shutter. Over here are two springs that help keep the film cassette in place so that the film comes out of this cassette properly. And then here's some foam around the, the window so that the uh, film type indicator window remains light tight. Some notes on this camera. The earliest Maxim bodies had the X's crossed. This one does not. Uh, the, later, the later Maxim bodies had the X's looking like this one does. The reason for that is because Exxon at the time, the, the petroleum company had crossed X's in their logo and so they sued Minolta claiming that the crossed X's violated Exxon's trademark. Uh, Minolta, when they designed the Maxim series, did not simply retrofit their SRT series, uh, which were their manual focus cameras, and their, their X series ones that preceded these with AF lenses and AF uh, hardware like, for instance, Pentax and Nikon uh, did. Minolta took the route that Canon did and they designed the Maxim series from the ground up. So Minolta engineered their autofocus cameras from scratch to be all new and created an entirely new mount and camera line for their autofocus bodies. Now interestingly Canon did the same thing Canon retained their user base. Minolta largely lost theirs, if I, if I understand correctly. 
and I've never understood exactly why, especially since these Maxims are fantastic cameras. This Maxim 7000 was the first ever camera that had both integrated autofocus and film advance in the same body. So where it autofocuses and then there's a motor that advances the film after you take the picture, this was the first camera to do that. And in many ways, the 7000 is the template upon which every future autofocus camera for every maker was based. It is that influential and that good of a camera. Uh, not only was it pioneering, it was so well refined that after this, all that the other manufacturers could really do was say, well, what's our spin on this design? Because of the way that Minolta approached the engineering of the new Maxim cameras, especially this one, the Minolta autofocus approach allowed for smaller autofocus lens size than the contemporary Pentax, Nikon, and Canon competing systems did. So this was a very compact autofocus lens and body system compared to what was out there. And, and I, I can't keep hammering that this is such a revolutionary uh, camera body. It, it blows my mind that Minolta could make a camera like this and then still have the problems that they did later. This was also uh, insofar as I can tell uh, from, from what I researched, the first ever digital camera. Yes. Minolta released a digital camera back for this camera that allowed users to make a one-third of a megapixel digital still image. One-third of a megapixel being something along the lines of 300 by two, uh, 250 very small at any rate uh, if you fi figure a megapixel a square megapixel is a thousand by a thousand you know a third of that would be 300 by 300 so so we're talking tiny tiny images so some things not to do with your camera firstly don't touch the mirror because your finger oils will tarnish the, the mirror it is a surface coated silver a mirror and also, it could remove the oils, and that will make it very hard for the autofocus to work. It will also make it hard to see the image in the viewfinder clearly. Don't touch the shutter that was in the back of the camera, because that's a very good way to brick an otherwise perfectly good camera. Don't leave your camera and your lenses in your car, because heat can damage it, the electronics, as well as the, the lubricating oils that help the mechanism to work properly. And the cold can damage it, same thing. Also, with this, because there's a lot of plastic in the camera, the heat and cold can break down the plastic and cause it to crack or become brittle. Don't store your camera in a plastic bag or box because moisture will make its way into that container and be trapped there and it will cause problems. Your lenses will get fungus and your camera can get fungus uh, or get corrosion. Also, don't let this get wet. It has a lot of electronics and it's not weather sealed, so if it gets wet, something will short out. And just remember that your camera is a precision tool and should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. So this is my first of two videos on the Minolta Maxim 7000. If this video was helpful, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know I'm on the right track and that I'm producing content which is helpful and useful to you. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. I'm pretty good about responding fairly quickly. If you have suggestions for other videos, also leave those in the comments below. And if I have the equipment and technical know-how, I'm more than happy to make those. If you'd like to subscribe, you can do that, and then you'll find out when I have more videos about photography and cameras, digital and film. And one last thing before we go, thank you guys for watching, and take great photos.